You know, it's kind of a fascinating mystery that Twitter, Facebook, like all these social networks are free. And it seems like almost none of them, except for YouTube, have experimented with removing ads for money. Mm -hmm. Can you like, do you understand that from a, both economics and the product perspective? Yeah, it's something that, you know, so I teach a course on digital business models. So I used to, used to at MIT at, at Stanford. I'm not quite sure. I'm not teaching until next spring. I'm still thinking what my course is going to be. Um, but there are a lot of different business models. I and mean, we have something that has zero marginal cost. There's a lot of forces, especially if there's any kind of competition that push prices down to zero. But you can have ad-supported systems. You can bundle things together. Um, you can have volunteer. You mentioned Wikipedia. There's donations. And uh, I think economists underestimate the power of volunteerism and, and donations. Um, you know, National Public Radio. Actually, how do you do this podcast? How is this? Uh, what's the revenue model? There's sponsors at the beginning. And then, okay. and people, the funny thing is I tell people they can, it's very, I tell them to the timestamp. So if you want to skip the sponsors, you, you're free. Uh, but the, it's funny that a bunch of people, so I read yeah. the the advertisement and they, a bunch of people enjoy reading it. And it's- Well, they may learn something from it. And also from the advertiser's perspective, those are people who are actually interested, you know? Exactly. Like, I mean, the example I sometimes give, like I, I bought a car recently and- all of a sudden, all the car ads were like interesting to me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then, like exactly. now that I have the car, like I sort of zone out on. But that's fine. The car companies, they don't really want to be advertising to me if I'm not going to buy their product. Right. Um, so there are a lot of these different revenue models, and you know, it, it, it's a little complicated. But the economic theory has to do with what the shape of the demand curve is. When it's better to monetize it with charging people versus when you're better off doing advertising. I mean, in short, on a, when, the, when the demand curve is relatively flat and wide, um, like generic news and things like that, then you tend to do better with um, advertising. If it's uh, a good that's only useful to a small number of people, but they're willing to pay a lot, they have a very high uh, value for it, then you advertising isn't going to work as well. And you're better off charging for it. Both of them have some inefficiencies. And then when you get into targeting and you get into these other revenue models, it gets more complicated. But there's some economic theory on it. I also think, to be frank, there's just a lot of experimentation that's needed because um, sometimes things are a little counterintuitive, especially when you get into what are called two-sided networks or platform effects, where um, you may grow the market on one side and harvest the revenue on the other side. You know, Facebook tries to get more and more users, and then they harvest the revenue from advertising. Um, so that's another way of, of kind of thinking about it. Is it strange to you that they haven't experimented? Well, they are experimenting. So, I, I, you know, they are doing some experiments about what the willingness is of, for people to pay. Yeah. Um, I I think that when they do the math, it, it's going to work out that, that they still are better off with an advertising-driven model. But um, What about a mix? Like, this is what's yeah. what YouTube is, right? Yeah. It's, uh, you uh, you allow the person to decide, the customer to decide yeah. exactly which model they prefer. Yeah, no, that can work really well. You know, and newspapers, of course, have known this for a long time. The Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, they have subscription revenue. They also have advertising revenue, and uh, uh, that can that can definitely work. The, online is a lot easier to have a dial that's much more personalized, and everybody can kind of roll their own mix. And I could imagine, um, you know, having a little slider about. Um, how much advertising you want or are willing to take. And if it's done right and it's incentive compatible, it, it can be a win-win where, where both the content provider and the consumer are better off than they would have been uh, before. Yeah, you know, the done right part is a uh, is really good point. Like with the with Jeff Bezos and the single click purchase on Amazon, the frictionless yeah. effort there. If I could just rant for a second about the Wall Street Journal, all the newspapers you mentioned mm -hmm. is... I have to click so many times yeah. to subscribe to them that I'm, I literally don't subscribe just because of the number of times I have to click. I'm totally with you. I don't understand why so many companies make it so hard. To sign. I mean, another example is when you buy a new iPhone or a new computer, or whatever, you, I feel like, okay, I'm going to like lose an afternoon just like loading up and getting all my yeah. stuff back. And, and for a lot of us, that's more of a deterrent than the price. Yeah. <laughs> and if they could, you know, make it, painless, we'd give them a lot more money. So I'm hoping somebody listening is, is working <laughs> on uh, on making it more painless for us to yeah. buy your products. If we could just like linger a little bit on the social network thing, because, uh, you know, there's this Netflix uh, 
social dilemma. Yeah, no, I and, saw that. And and, uh, and and Tristan Harris and company. Yeah, and you know, people's data. People are. It's really sensitive, and and social networks are at the core, arguably, of uh, many of societal like tension and some of the most right. important things happening in society. So it feels like it's important to get this right. It is both from a business model perspective and just like a trust perspective. I I still gotta. I mean, it just still feels like I I know there's experimentation going on. It still feels like everyone is afraid to try different business models. Like really try. Well, I'm worried that. People are afraid to try different business models. I'm also worried that some of the business models may lead them to bad choices. And, um, you know, Danny Kahneman talks about system one and system two, sort of like our reptilian brain that reacts quickly to what we see, see something interesting, we click on it, we retweet it, versus our system two, you know, our frontal cortex that's supposed to be more careful and rational, that really doesn't make as many decisions as it should. Um, I think there's a tendency for a lot of these social networks to really exploit system one, our quick, instant reaction, make it so we just click on stuff and pass it on and not really think carefully about it. And and that system, it tends to be driven by, you know, sex, violence, disgust, anger, fear, you know, um, these relatively primitive kinds of emotions. Maybe they're important for a lot of purposes, but they're not a great way to organize a society. And, and most importantly, when you think about this huge, amazing information infrastructure we've had that's connected, you know, billions of brains across the globe, not just we can all access information, but we can all contribute to it and share it. Arguably, the most important thing that that network should do is favor truth over falsehoods. And the way it's been designed, not necessarily intentionally, is exactly the opposite. My uh, my MIT colleagues, Sinan Aral and, and Deb Roy and, and others at, at MIT did a, a terrific paper in the cover of Science, and they documented what we all feared, which is that lies spread faster than truth on yeah. social networks. They looked at a bunch of tweets and retweets, and they found that false information was more likely to spread further, faster to more people. Yeah. And why was that? It's not because people like lies. It's because people like things that are shocking, amazing. Can you believe this? Something that is not mundane, not that something everybody else already knew. And what are the most unbelievable things? Well, lies. <laughs> and so you, if you want to find something unbelievable, it's a lot easier to do that if you're not constrained by the truth. So they found that the, the emotional valence of false information was just much higher. It was more likely to be shocking and therefore more likely to be spread. Another interesting thing was that that wasn't necessarily driven by the algorithms. Um, I know that there are, is some evidence, uh, you know, Zeynep Tefeki and others have pointed out in YouTube, some of the algorithms unintentionally were tuned to amplify more extremist content. But um, in the study of Twitter that Sinan and Deb and others did, um, they found that even if you took out all the bots and all the uh, automated tweets, you still had lies spreading significantly faster. It's just the problem is with ourselves that we just can't resist passing on this salacious content. The, but I also blame the platforms because you know there's different ways you can design a platform. You can design a platform in a way that makes it easy to spread lies and to retweet and spread things on, or you can kind of put some friction on that and try to favor truth. I had dinner with Jimmy Wales once, you know, the guy who uh, helped found... Uh, uh, Wikipedia. Wikipedia. And, uh, and he, he convinced me that, look, you know, you can make some design choices, whether it's at Facebook, at Twitter, at Wikipedia or, or Reddit, whatever. And depending on how you make those choices, you're more likely or less likely to have false news. Create a little bit of friction, like you said. Yeah. It, you know, that's the, uh, and sorry it could be friction. It could be speeding the truth, you know, either way, but, and, and, I don't totally understand. Speaking the truth, I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, amplifying it and giving it more credit. Yeah. And, you know, like in, in academia, which is far, far from perfect, but, you know, when someone has an important discovery, it tends to get more cited and it, people kind of look to it more and sort of it tends to get amplified a little bit. So you could try to do that too. Um, I don't know what the silver bullet is, but I, I, the meta point is that if we spend time thinking about it, 
we can amplify truth over falsehoods. And I'm disappointed in in the heads of these social networks that they haven't been as successful or maybe haven't tried as hard to amplify truth. And part of it, going back to what we said earlier, is you know these revenue models may push them more towards growing fast, spreading information rapidly, getting lots of users, which isn't the same thing as finding truth. 